Hello, I am Radagast at your service with Mystic View, number 10 on February 28th, 2016. And I am joined by my co-host, Shelly. And I would just like Shelly to say hello to everybody. Hello, everybody. I'm so happy to be here sharing space with you again. Oh. Well, thank you. And so today's topic is community, community building. Um, and the, I just feel like the importance of us starting to really have the conversation about communities because of the new paradigm is gonna, is gonna really require us to rethink community and in certain cases rebuild community. Um, so that's the conversation I'm, I'm going to be having today. And fortunately, Shelley is very much involved uh, with Echo Village, or community building herself. It's part of um, her family project. And so I just feel like if this is something that's near and dear to my heart, something I think is really important, and something that I learned quite a bit about when I, the seven, the six years, I worked for seven years, but I lived for six years um, at Omega Holistic Community in Rhinebeck, New York, um, six months at a time. And th that experience of how we lived to bring together a community, how we interacted with each other, how we ate together, how we partied together, how we studied together, did yoga together, just everything was really done as portions of the community interacting together at all times. Having coffee, you know, the, the cafe um, where people would go in and there were a lot of tables and be a lot of subgroupings. But it also could be a place where music could happen. There was also a main hall where talks could, ha be ha could, could happen or a bigger musical type of event. And then there was also um, the, ca uh, the, the something by the lake and it had a, gra a baby grand piano in it, a, a small performance stage and less room than the main hall. But between all of these different, and we, ha and we had a lake to use with canoes and kayaks and rowboats. And if there was one there, you used it. And uh, just how, the sh the, how sharing resources um, contribu contributes, contributes to togetherness. Um, my, I guess my best scenario I'd like to start with, just as, just as is a concept of where I'm coming from, is that um, at Omega, we had a, a little piece of what is actually called Big Pond, but it really looked like a lake. And I would say the beachfront was probably no more than 200 feet, which is, you know, kind of when you have um, a half acre property, you would have 100 by 200 feet. It's not, you know, it's not, it's a nice piece of property, but nothing huge. So similarly, we could imagine having the similar kind of property privately on a lake. So a lot of private people might live on a lake and have exactly the same amount of beachfront as Omega did, and it was shared by a lot of people. And how if you owned a private lakefront yourself, if somebody were to kind of canoe near your shore or to walk near your beach, there might be a little bit like, ooh, who's this? You know, especially because if you're living on your own property, who's it? Is you, maybe, maybe your significant other, your wife, whoever that is, your kids, some friends, but you'd probably be a small group. And so, and the, the natural thing of when we own our own property is that any approaches, there's a certain amount of suspicion. Now that's not necessarily a bad thing because again, any, you want to always know what your environment is, but there is, it's almost like immediately projected that this could be a violation where, where, when, where we're at Omega, where there might be 25 of us on the beach or 10 or whatever, when we see somebody either approaching from land or approaching from water, the thing isn't like, oh, who's that? It's like, oh, who's that? Who's joining the party? And so there's a, there's a lot of joy in when you own things in common, because when you own things in common, you, the, uh, the joy is in the experience of, of, of what we all have together. Where when you own things by yourself, I really feel that joy in many ways is almost, is almost in, in an isolation um, 
because we see how, uh, in my opinion, we see how easily that joy can be shattered if it seems threatened. And so, it, and the other thing with being in a group, if you were the tiny family and people coming in, you might wonder, oh, is there enough of us? Where when you're in real groups, these things that might appear as threats to a smaller group, to a bigger group, even if they aren't the friendliest, it's like, hey, there's plenty of us here, who cares? Um, because everything is, you're not, everything that's being handled is handled by a community and not just a family. Um, so that's kind of, that's my starting idea on um, the psychology of owning things in common versus the psychology of owning it yourself and having to quote unquote protect it, keep it or whatever itself, the maintenance of it. Um, was that a good way to kind of start a conversation on community, do you think, Shelley? I think that was really useful because what you said is that often our joy is sacrificed for protection. Mm -hmm. We don't want to even need protection. What we want is joy. And I, that's a given. And so this individualized sense of living that we've been drawn into has created the scenario where we need to protect our stuff, protect our our isolated little lives and, and try to expand on that. But yet if we were living in community, the sharing, that's how, that's where humanity thrives. Mm -hmm. Look at any time there's a, a natural disaster. You know what? It's horrible. It's devastating, but people are thriving because that's motivated them to give. And that's, that's our joy. That's our love is when we're connected. I see, there are so many positive benefits to pursuing this type of a lifestyle as opposed to going on in our individual separation. And I think even global consciousness is really getting a handle on what separation, the whole notion of separation has done, kind of where that has led. We could, I mean, we could take this right to freedom and how community actually supports joy and freedom, as opposed to making you feel like, oh, I gotta share that space. It's actually an opening for freedom. Well, what's interesting is because I feel that a lot of what interrupts our coming together is media. The, the psychology or the thoughts that get put into our head. And the interesting thing was that Omega, None of the, they, a lot, they were, you know, they were the dorms. We who lived there all the time stayed, and then we had our guests, and they stayed. Sometimes they stayed in a dorm, or they might stay in cabins. Different, we had different accommodations, but nowhere were there TVs. There was one TV in Omega, and that was, there was one house kind of that was devoted to having a TV, also, often a lot of times for watching DVDs and things, but also it was cable TV, and that was called the big house. And people tend to go there to, and, so, you know, this is kind of like some people liked regular, say like a group of people liked a particular show, they'd go to the big house to watch that show. But there was only one TV in all of Omega for that kind of intrusion. And I, th and I think that, and the fact, and there was only so many people that could go into the big house and it, can, it tend to be kind of clickish. It was kind of like those few people who could not remove themselves from TV would hang out there, but most other people hung out in the cafe or you know the, var the various things that we could do, and or like myself, often went and holed up in my tent because that's after a day of 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 working in the wellness center, I needed my time to kind of recreate myself, which is where we get recreation. And so it's just really, I really feel that one of the greatest adversaries to our thinking as groups is the media which always wants to break us up through in by planting i'm going to call little idea bombs or little idea viruses um that just kind of get taken in they are um, they're aimed at our emotions so if they hit us in our emotions they take us out of our third chakra or or more you know easier we're clearer processing and now get us into like the, the slightly muddier waters of 
what, you know, of, of having our feelings evoked. Um, so it is really, uh, it is really interesting that a big part to me of building community is having enough activity and having enough common purpose where TV would be like one of the last things you would think you would want to do with your time. That's really beautiful because what we're doing is supporting and nourishing people's actual values. Do you know so many people in my work have never even figured out what their values actually are. They're so under the auspice of social conditioning, as you were describing it, as what is fed to us by media, social media, um, that they have never even actually stop to figure out what their real values are. And so beyond even just the emotional content, I, I think that it, we become very susceptible to an egoic lead as opposed to a heart lead, right? In, instead of being led by our heart and what we know is in our highest good and the highest good, when we thrive, the people around us thrive. Mm -hmm. It's a domino effect, and it goes either way. So we can certainly take action steps to make it a positive domino effect. And that brings us to kind of the political, the political guidance of how does this operate, right? It's not a hierarchical establishment. It's not a group of people doing, that would be a cult. Mm -hmm. how, do you see, how do you see creating that equal equality, even though this person might love to do the certain work eight hours a day and somebody else would rather be playing, you know, with the kids or something like that, where everybody is still not just valued for what they bring, but that they're they are equally as valuable and seen as, as equally valued because they're participating in the community. It's like, um, you know, in my family, in my family, the on the Blackfoot, the grandpa put a lot of financial support into giving one child an education. She uh, was not higher than than the others but she was given all kind of this the financial support she ended up being a water systems environmental specialist whereas another child was given all the ability to become the spiritual leader she was trained in the ceremony and given the rights to to be that for her her people so it takes every Everybody brings a very important element, and, and we don't need to duplicate each other, but it's for the greater good of the whole. Same like your body has to be for the greater good of the whole. Yes. You know, you don't just support a few cells in your fingertips. You don't specialize and say the eyes are more important than the ears. If this, is a, this is a collective that we, that we need to support the whole. And that's a mentality. That's a mentality that... that that is so nourishing and supports. So I, I just had a little analogy, right? It's, you don't get st stuck looking at, at the finger pointing to the moon, you're actually looking to the moon. So what, what is the goal of this community living? What is that? It's for the enduring qualities to enhance lifestyle. Do you wanna talk anything add to about the political kind of structure that you would see? as being successful? Well, yes, because I really feel that the way community tends to build is you, you have the original people who have an idea and they have some structure in it mm -hmm. and they see how they can pull other people who are wanting to belong to something but don't, haven't really brainstormed it. So the thing is, you, mm -hmm. so you try to identify people with like, okay, I, there's a group of us who already have some structure and some concept, and all it needs is people. And if, so if you feel, and, and you share the information about what it is that you're putting together and what it looks like, 
and what it might look like in the future. But the key word there is what it might look like because as people come in, they bring their own ideas. And of course, um, the idea is if the, and, and the people who are, to me, the people in the community are really waiting for those other ideas to arrive because the ideas that allowed it to start are the starting ideas. I mean, as, as, you, as you and I, as members of GMOP have seen, there was a period, I mean, especially for myself, I mean, there was a period when it was GMOP with Zoom meetings with five people. And, um, and at one, I mean, I was TVOP. And at one point, towards the end of TVOP, it was Zoom meetings with three people. And then things launched, the symposium began, and that's really when we started finding our family. And even, so even now, as GMOP has grown out, it has been based upon who has shown up, how they represent, the ideas they bring in, um, and the, the, the natural synergies. And so for me, in many ways, any, any people who start as quote unquote kind of the leading edge, I'm not gonna call them the leaders, but they're, kind, they have, they're the ones who kind of planted the seed or found the field or whatever, you want to, whatever analogy you wanna use. But as people come in and as it grows larger, it has to have the input. And, um, and so, people, you know, so people find their own balance. I really feel that, and, and to, you know, for me, the, the organizing of the, of the organism, okay, that's an organism is an organ, is, is a bunch of disparate parts organizing for a greater whole and in, in synergistic fashion, which is nothing, another word for teamwork. Teamwork is synergy. And um, so I don't, and I, political is, a, is an interesting word for me, only because when I look at politics, I see dysfunction. And I see dysfunction from it because sometimes you'll have two we're just considered equally valid points of view that constantly struggle with each other, um, almost forming their own blocks. And I feel that's a division that we never really want to have. Um, because for, for me, like, let's take, you know, America supposedly has two main parties. So America is like one organism, but it has two heads. And they often are going in different directions. Mm -hmm. That is complete schizophrenia. That you can, that is, that is dysfunctional. That is no way to do anything. And some people, was it just one party? No parties. There's no parties. It's one organism. And, and the organism is, is all about input from all parts. And generally, you will have ideas. That, I mean, I really feel when you're sharing one heart, the whole idea is everybody puts up their ideas and certain ideas, including your own, like, I mean, I, I part of brainstorming such sessions, put in some ideas, and then somebody comes in and I go, ah, nah, nah. And an idea that I thought was really good showed, showed its holes. And that's the other thing is we need to come with our hearts because our hearts don't worry about if somebody exposes an idea of ours for having a certain weakness because we're not egoically attached to it. Um, we, we bring it forward with all the good, actually bring it forward to be looked at. It's almost like I had this idea. Can you check it for healthiness? And if somebody finds that there's something raggedy about it, you are glad that that was found. Actually, you're not like, Oh, I guess my idea wasn't so good. No, keep again. And, and, and as I guess, as a musician, I know what it's like to constantly be adding to the mix with ideas that get, that get, that it's no sooner get tried out than they get tossed but you get to try them out. And so it really is a case where everybody's heard. They're heard in full. They're understood in full. And so, and, and I think that's kind of quote, a political process that is missing, where in fact, there, you, you are represented because you represent yourself. And that's the other thing is sometimes why I think there needs to be more autonomy for smaller pieces of, of communities that then inter, inter, interact with each other like a body, like different organs in a body. Um, so there isn't too, too much 
where the, where the top or the organ, what considers the organizing principle is not removed. It's actually local. And then those localities coordinate to a greater synergy. I hope that made sense. Yeah, it did. It drew a really, a really beautiful picture of how, of how every element has equal value and equal importance, but, but in a self-organizing um, manner mm -hmm. where um, the synergy, just as, as you described it, is a self organ is in its own self organizing capacity and it's not restricted by okay we had this idea originally we have to stick to it no we integrate as we grow i love the analogy we could we could use the human biology as a really perfect analogy but tell me is this a sort of build it they will come scenario or are there signals do you think that get sent out once once the idea reaches a certain maybe coherence in structure or form how do you see that because there are many communities that have been tried and some have been successful and, and some fail right away we could look at what worked and what didn't work but just in the initial stages do we just jump in and start building it and, and, and know that that's attracting a certain like-minded community? Well, it depends on what you talk about, build it and they will come. Um, for me, one of the crucial points of community is you have to have common purpose. Basically, common mm -hmm. work is what I mean by common purpose where the community actually uh, as far again we're still in a system that that works with money and we, but we can also transition some barter but there has there's trade let's put it that way there's there's a trade aspect to all of these various organs or, or autonomous units being able to sustain each other so i really feel that when you do build a community you have to have a purpose for that community other than just being together I mean, again, in win-win, you get everything. So if you, it's like, oh, I just really would like to hang out with, with like-minded peeps or actually like-hearted peeps. And we'll get back to that in a minute, like-hearted. Mm -hmm. um, where that's one thing that you want to have happen. But the thing is, once you get there, what do you do? And so I really feel that a part of responsible new paradigm community building is that you that you have an idea of why you're calling people that you there's there's already so, there's already something to do and it's not and it's not built on buying shares or what any of this where you get as removed from um having to buy your way into things i mean to me this is actually more of how you can work your way into things because that's what we are. That is what the ultimate value of anything any, that is offered is what we are willing to do individually and build together. Money, money is nothing more than a representation that we have decided to give our labor for this thing. But it, the, whole, the whole system is built on what we do. I mean, a hive would not exist without the various bees doing their functions. Some getting pollen, some some building cells, some carrying the, uh, taking care of the queen, some taking care of the brood. I mean, there's there's a purpose to a hive, and of course, the what they need and for a hive, they need raw materials, and they source those raw materials from nature. So, I mean, the hive has a purpose, and. Um, so I just really, communities have to have a purpose. And so that, that's really, so to me, yes, call them, they will come, but don't call, you don't call them until you're ready for them to come. So, and that's, and that's to me part of the, the people, what we call the, the original organizing unit, the most compact thing, is they have to know what they're calling, what they're building, how, what it at least looks like to get started where everybody can kind of have a sustainable toehold where they can stay long, together long enough and be sustained so that they can grow, so they can grow very simply so they can grow. That's so encouraging. That's so encouraging because everybody has experienced how 
how monetary uh, focus derails you from your actual goals of that or values. So when we can take that completely out of out of the equation, what we're left with is something similar to what you brought up about about the hive. How does that work? And we could even look to different natural communities, such as um, the, the cetaceans, for example, or or the hot. You know, I mean, even our insects offer so much wisdom if we wanted to just look at how they are successful. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a very fluid. Yeah. No, I was just thinking about like, you know, some animal that tries to, you know, that lives quite solitarily as a spider. It's not an insect, it's an arachnid. But, you know, for most people, it's a bug. Um, you know, it's in the bug category. But we, you can, in many ways, you see how, how by living alone, how it's exposed much more to the vicissitudes of environment and whatever, as opposed to like ant colonies, termites. Especially, up, and that's especially natural termites. Some people go, oh, I don't like termites. They break down my house. We well, go to Africa and you'll see the mounds. They're not hurting anybody's houses. They're communities. And when you look at the various communal animals, they, they are much more, much more able to sustain the vicissitudes of change and nature and whatever because they have a unit where a spider, I mean, you could accidentally take down its web and, you know, it's, it's very, it gets compromised very easily. And I feel that's part of kind of being a hermit first being integrated into a community. Um, and you, you just, you see the strength of doing things together and, and having, you know, and again, having done that experience of being in a community of like hearted people is the richest it is the absolute richest I've ever felt living in a tent and feeling like a wealthy man. Why? Cause I had halls, grand pianos, yoga studios of uh, my own a lake. I could go to anytime I want to three meals cooked for me a day. Plus the ability to go in between meals into the back room and have some leftovers. I mean, just at, all I had to do is show up. And of course, I had my assignment within this organism, and I carried out my assignment well. But the people who were feeding me and preparing my food, that was their assignment. And, it, and it's, it's really about coordinating our efforts where we all nourish each other with our, with our labors. And not, again, where what we do nourishes the community and not someone outside the community. We're, we're, it's, you know, we're not giving it away. And the current uh, financial situation is a lot of what our labor and the, the rewards of it go to people who are not actually helping us. And so it's really about... Yes, the rewards would go... The rewards stay local except for what, what, what rewards that are used for trade and commerce. I like that. I like that because where that leads me is to think, I think this is exponentially beneficial because yes, it's benefiting the, the local community, but there's always surplus when you work together, just, yes. you know, go to a potluck, you just bring one little meal. There is always surplus. And so then that's what's offered to the external communities and then they are also benefiting from your nucleus. Mm -hmm. And then maybe that's how the community grows is because they're seeing all, all the benefits and all the successes. And so, you know, why they want to do it too kind of thing. I think Ubuntu had a little experience with that mm -hmm. in South Africa. I haven't looked at the recent developments, but I know initially that's how it went. I, I applaud what they're doing. And then the social I applaud what they're yes. doing. I, although I know they're doing a little bit of a hybrid. I mean, I saw that as a, um, that to me, the strategic depth of, of what they're doing. What, Michael, Mike, I did not hear that in Michael Kellinger's words, strategic depth. I'm trying to have some strategic right. depth in this concept. Ubuntu is definitely within what I'm talking about. To me, Ubuntu is just a natural progression. And I'm glad he's introduced that as a concept. So it's because it's a little clearer. 
um, and there's some people who are practicing it, so we get a chance to get data from them about what they're doing. But I, I feel it has, to, but as they're also experiencing, you still need a means of conducting trade with others. And so this means some, some kind of medium that might not um, fit the Ubuntu, Ubuntu um, paradigm because it's really, right now it's kind of like you're bringing like-minded, like-hearted people together or at least like-hearted people to, to, who are conducting the experiment. Um, and I, we, are in a transi- we are in a transitional period. So there's going to be high, there's going to be certain hybrid hybridization of concepts, and from what I've heard about some of the Ubuntu communities, they're still very dependent on outside jobs and stuff to kind of like almost so that they had, can buy something to trade it, and so you can still see little glitches, yeah. um, as opposed where for me one of the real things is that as a community you should be making raw materials. I mean, you know, where you have woodworkers, metal workers, um, seamstresses, various talents where you are producing product that other people want. High, and one of the most important things is you might go, oh, well, they already make chairs. They don't make good ones. Everything is made like garbage. Mm-hmm. Almost everything is made like garbage. So the whole thing is you get back to also <clears throat> producing things that endure. Right now, almost everything you bought you buy as not meant to endure it's meant to fall apart within a within a, a time period that you think is reasonable for the amount of money you spent it's almost like try to gauge you it's like okay i paid this much for it if i get this much use okay i guess i got my money's worth as opposed to when you purchase something made by people who care about other people it's like you should be able to give this to your grandchildren right now everything's built as you'll be giving this to the dump and so there's you know, a you know, real kind of change of mindset. And I think by returning to what endures and, and relying on our own creativity for always being able to come up with whatever people value, as opposed to cutting back on the value so that people always have to go back for more of the same thing because this, the thing that was given them had a, t- had a time bomb in it. At a certain point, it goes, and time for a new one. And I don't see, that's not what endures. And we, I really, we have to focus on what endures and not the flavor of the month and, and the joy of buying something new. How about the joy of something that you can get to like and you don't have to stop liking it because it stopped becoming functional. And that's really the focus. I like that. You're describing. You go. I'm just saying you're describing the longevity of the ripple effect. Where, where how it has enhanced you personally is rippling out to your family, to your community, to the surrounding area. I mean, we're going to talk about the ripple effect of Gaia herself or of Mother Earth herself. And you know the difference between wearing some garment that's, you know, made from polyester compared to the joy of wearing beautiful fabric. Or the difference between eating nourishing food that you feel great when you've consumed it and you feel powerful and, and vibrant as opposed to, you know, whatever was cooked up and stored for two months. And so the quality of the life right, right from the very nucleus is, enhances all the way around. How lovely it is, you know, to to have quality everywhere that you look. Because doesn't that affect your mindset? Doesn't that also affect how you think and how you feel about yourself and how you feel about the people in your community or your family? Absolutely, because it's what I'm quality. Really, what I'm speaking to is basically the cons- the people, who, the consumers in this case, are basically have been programmed to accept a certain amount of being ripped off. And right. that's a bad mindset mm-hmm. where you're actually willing to accept being abused. And so th- when you accept, ah. abuse, so you're actually accepting abuse. So wh- what does that say about us? We accept abuse. 
you know, I think it's time for us to stop accepting being abused where we put down boundaries. And so in many ways, we don't necessarily expect our abusers to change their behavior. We're going to change our behavior by no longer relying or dealing or trading with abusers. They depend on us. That's the whole thing. We, they are completely dependent on us. So if we don't say enough with the abuse and then get around to redressing these issues and creating our own, our own industry, so to speak, and I'm not talking about smokestack industry, um, then we start, we, uh, this is the whole new paradigm is we're building a new paradigm. And so the whole thing is we, we build and we repopulate and we basically leave that and we no longer give our energy to that. And what we don't give our energy to will go away. They stand on us. Their existence is completely dependent on us. And but we have to come to that agreement, uh, that, uh, that uh, um, understanding, and then enter into new agreements with each other. Um, and I think that's part of the going ahead. So with the time we have left, unless you have something you want to end, then you will have that opportunity. But I want to go to the good news, how we close Mystic View. Um, unless you will have a last piece to, to yeah. a conversation. Well, I believe the last piece I would have would tie us into the good news because what you were just describing is the psychology of community where we are feeding the change that we want to affect. You know, we just start being it. It's like you can write your own good news. It's a very fluid um, scenario and when we are talking about the psychology of community uh, the cetaceans are a really prime example of that exactly so my good news to share with everyone is that the whales off the coast of Southern California and Hawaii have recently really won a victory in response to a lawsuit brought about by the Natural Resources Defense Council, the US Navy has now agreed to restrict its use of damaging sonar and explosives in these habitats, in the cetacean habitats. And how the cetacean community affects humanity, I'm sure everybody is going to see the ripple effect of that. And uh, that is really prime good news. And there's a lot more information about it, but is there anything that you would like to add or, or within the water stories of good news that are coming about all over the planet, all the, all the devices for clearing and cleaning any water pollution. There are so many good stories. I chose the cetacean and whale story because it pertains to community living and we have so much to learn even from from these types of natural examples okay i'm glad you said whales because when you you would use the word cetacean almost exclusively and i realize that for certain people that is a word that might not immediately translate into whales and dolphins and that particular grouping of sea oh, yeah. mammals okay um sea lions mm -hmm. and seals are not cetaceans even though they're sea mammals we're specifically talking about the whale and dolphin group and that is great news because when i the the sonar and explosions and just general make uh, trashing of the ocean sonically um is something that has been very painful mm -hmm. <laughs> because really what they've been doing in, in the oceans is the equivalent of playing really loud, horrible music. I mean, the equivalent, if you want to understand what has been going on for our, our cetaceans in the oceans for years, thanks to the United States Navy and perhaps other navies, but the, again, with the largest military in the world, whatever the United, whatever a branch of our armed forces does is dwarfs what anybody else is doing. And so these sonars are, again, they're these very powerful signals being sent through the water. And the water is their medium, like the air is our medium. And so 
if you lived in a neighborhood where somebody put two loud subwoofers and big, it's kind of like having a professional PA system on somebody's roof in your neighborhood and the music never stops and it's just pounding music and you're expected to conduct your daily life and have conversations in the street as this music is pounding into you. Just imagine how that would make you crazy. Just imagine how that, that unrelenting noise in your environment 24 seven would affect you. And you might have an idea of, of how the whales and the dolphins have been experiencing their world. And so what Shelly is speaking about is that this, somebody has decided that they're gonna shut that noise off and allow them to have some peace and quiet in their world. And for me, that's not good news, even if we didn't have Fukushima. But with the challenges of what's going on, in, and especially the Northern Pacific, Pacific Ocean, um, for them, for me to have one major um, um, disruption, disruption, you know, like something that would hurt their immune systems just through b being made crazy. Um, that now that they will have a, a greater, re maybe a greater resistance to some of the radiation and, the, you know, and, and also just a degradation of their environment. Um, and I mean, we all know that the, the Northern Pacific Ocean is close to a dead zone. And um, that's, that's a lot of your backyard or your world to, to have taken from you. So at least they've been given the solace and some peace where they can find it without this horrible rate, uh, sonar being blasted through their world by the Navy. It is very, very good news. Well, and it goes really well beyond even just noise pollution. The sonar can have a range of effect on all marine animals. You know, on one end of the scale, you have outright death. If whales are close enough to high intensity source, it'll damage their internal organs. There are indications of bleeding from the ears and the eyes, and this is supposed to be good news. So, so but you can get how important that this impact is and and that's that's at a distance the close the closer range ones it, you know so the further away from the source whales can suffer yes permanent or temporary hearing loss and it gets much worse for those closer to to the actual sonar so this is really really positive news because we're all connected and um it's it's like saying okay so something stop being disruptive in your stomach. We know this is going to affect the whole. This has been a really positive step forward for, for all of the earth because we are connected. We are all one. And I do believe you had one more story that in many ways ties in. I'm gonna mention the man's name, uh, Manoj Bhargava. Manoj Bhargava um, is the man who is known as uh, for creating something called Billions in Change. I know of three basic technologies he's come up with. One is um, some, some balloons that pulse and allow your blood to return, um, your lower body blood to return into your body and it allows for the greater oxygenation. That's one. The other one is he's developed a very low cost way of turning any kind of water, whether it's seawater or sewage, into clean water. And it uses membranes that do not have to be constantly uh, replaced like a lot of other um, technologies. And it can be scalable, it can be done. It, it, the, the one that I've seen could basically would be a household unit, but they can also be put on boats, put out in a, a bay, produce, uh, and, and creating fresh water from the bay that it can be piped in. And, 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 and again, it's, it's, it's scalable. It's just you kind of add another bar to more of these and as many as you can make it means the more clean water you have from the ocean. And then the last thing was he had something that works on a bicycle, it's a recline a bicycle and you pedal. And apparently if you pedal well enough, if you, there's a meter that tells you, you can have in one hour, you can produce enough energy for 24 hours of low amperage electricity use. By low amperage, I mean, um, those would be things that are not heaters or refrigerators or power tools per se. This is more for lights, computers, 
phones, you know, kind of things that do not require a lot of amperage or um, the kind of electricity that, that creates kinetic movement per se. Because you're putting in that kinetic movement, you're turning it into, into electricity. So anyway, so he has these three things. But if I recall, you're speaking about a 17-year-old woman who has actually combined two of these things into one project. Do you want to tell us about it? That's exactly right. So how great that these individual inventions exist. But here's this brilliant young lady, Cynthia. She's a 17-year-old Australian high school student. So she designed a solution to just both problems at once. The device purifies wastewater, and it uses the pollutants in the water to boost power production in a separate compartment. So her prototype was called H2Pro. And when I looked it up, there are a lot of elements, different people using H2Pro. And it has, so you'll need, if you want to look further into this, you'll need to uh, get, get past just the name because it's actually a portable device and it's powered by sunlight. So dirty water goes in uh, one end. There's a titanium mesh that's activated by the sun, which sterilizes the water and sends it um, through an extra filter. And it, it's a photo uh, catalytic reaction. So we're splitting the water into hydrogen and oxygen. This these ideas are so simple, but yet elegant. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm so happy that she brought this forward, but a little surprised that it took us this long to uh, recognize something that simple. Mm. You know, so I, it's just a flip of a switch to start feeding a hydrogen fuel cell to produce clean water. So all of the pollutants are what are actually powering and, and producing the energy, producing the fuel. Mm -hmm. well, and I'm not going to bore everybody by giving them all the, the exact specifics and numbers, but, you know, she's on the web and uh, anybody that would like to learn more or, you know what, stand on her shoulders and invent the next step. Mm. Let's look at that. Let's expand this out. I agree, and I think it's a great place for us to conclude our show. Um, very good news, and I enjoyed my conversation with you, Shelley, and I look forward to doing it again. And so I just, Shelley, why don't you, why don't you say goodbye to our people? I will. Thank you, everybody, for sharing this time with us. We're having a lot of fun here and look forward to more good news. There is a lot of good news. And how about if we write our own? How about if we take that onus upon ourselves? Until mm. next time. Until next time, this is Mystic View with Radagast and Shelley. God bless. <laughs>